Thanks for coming. My name is Mikko, and I've spent my life fighting cybercrime and trying to understand where the attacks are coming from. Who creates the malware? Who creates the viruses, worms, and trojans? Who sends the spams that we see? That means that I've been researching organized criminal gangs and nation-state attacks. And for the last two years, I've been writing a book in which I spent a lot of time thinking about how the world has changed and what exactly changed with this technology revolution that we are all living through. And I guess the easiest way to think about it is that internet revolution took away geography, it took away distance, it took away borders. Business used to be mostly local, now it's mostly global. Crime used to be mostly local, now it's mostly global. And wars used to be mostly local as well. Technology has always shaped the way we fight our wars. It has always shaped the way we fight our conflicts. Hundreds of years ago, when we were fighting our wars, the weapons we had were swords and bows and arrows. Until we get better technology, including the technology to build ships, warships, which means war expanded from land to sea. And then, thanks to technology, it expanded with planes to air, then with satellites to space, and now to cyberspace. And when we look at modern conflicts and modern wars, they are being fought in all of these domains. The wars we see today are fought on land, on sea, in air, in space, and in cyberspace. And for the last 15 years, all advanced countries, all advanced nations have been stockpiling more and more cyber weapons. Countries, militaries, and intelligence agencies are building not only defense, but also offense in this new, new realm, new domain for war. So what are cyber weapons? Cyber weapons are code. They are tools which can be used to break into enemies' systems. They exploit vulnerabilities, they carry in payloads, and the payloads can be destructive or they can be used for spying and espionage. And what makes cyber weapons different is that cyber weapons are effective, affordable, and deniable. A weapon which is effective, affordable, and deniable, that's a pretty good weapon. It's a weapon which gets the job done. It's effective. It's affordable. It's cheaper than the alternatives. And the best part, it's deniable. You can deny that it wasn't your weapon. It was someone else. And that part applies to no other types of weapons we have. If you launch a fleet of bomber jets to fly on foreign soil to drop bombs on top of your enemy, it's kind of hard to deny that it was your bombers. Everybody can see them flying with flags on their side. But when you do the equivalent attack using cyber weapons, you can keep denying that this never happened. Is this a theoretical example? No, it's not. Just think about what happened in 2010 with Stuxnet. Stuxnet, which still remains one of the most famous, one of the most important cyber weapons in history. And we all know who wrote Stuxnet. Stuxnet was written by the governments of the United States and Israel, and the target was the nuclear enrichment system of Iran. And yes, they could have accomplished exactly the same thing by dropping bombs on top of Bushrer, Qom, and Natanz, the enrichment centers in Iran. But they chose to use a sub cyber weapon instead. And the end result is that we still today cannot 100% confirm who did it. 
I guess we all agree, was most likely USA and Israel, but we actually don't really know it. And this is the benefit of cyber weapons. Stuxnet was also the first time a code written by military officers was deployed in an attack which could have killed people. Now, as far as we know, nobody died in the Stuxnet attacks on the Iranian nuclear enrichment systems, but they were blowing up centrifuges which were circulating tens of thousands of rotations per second filled with uranium gas. And when Stuxnet started disrupting these centrifuges, they exploded violently, which means if there were scientists close by, they died. Now, as I said, as far as we know, the information Iran has released, they haven't said anything about that. But the important thing here is the attackers, the programmers who wrote the code, they must have understood what they're doing. They must have understood that now we're taking a risk that this piece of code, these lines of code, might take human lives. And that's a historic border to cross. If nuclear scientists lost their innocence in 1945, when the mankind used a nuclear weapon against other humans for the first time, exactly in the same way, computer scientists lost their innocence in 2010. All modern conflicts, all modern wars now involve cyber weapons. And just like real world weapons, cyber weapons rust as well. They rust away, they rot and rust, they don't work forever. If you build a tank, the tank will work for 40 years, 50 years maybe, then you have to replace it. If you buy a fighter jet, you have to replace them every 20 years. They don't work forever. Exactly the same thing applies to cyber weapons. Why? Well, cyber weapons target vulnerabilities in the systems we use. A cyber weapon could be targeting a bug in a military system which is used for targeting of cruise missiles. Or it could be something more mundane, targeting a vulnerability in Windows 11 or latest version of Google Chrome. So if you have a new cyber weapon today, which is targeting a zero day, completely unknown vulnerability, for example, in Windows, how long will it work? If it works today, and no one knows about the vulnerability that you're targeting, how long will it work? Will it work for you? a year, two years, five years, 10 years? It's not going to work for 10 years, that's quite certain. Why? Because the bug will be found and fixed. If it's a vulnerability in Windows, Microsoft will eventually find it, or a independent researcher working for their bug bounty will find it and it will get fixed. And even if it doesn't get found, the systems change. Systems get rewritten, architectures change. Eventually it will not work. And this means that cyber weapons have a limited shelf life. They have a best before date. You have to use them before that date. And what makes cyber weapons different from real world weapons is deterrence. Most weapons are mostly useful for their deterrence power, for the power they have simply by having the weapons and making sure that your enemies know that you have the weapons. This is the reason why we do military parades, to show off the fighter jets and the tanks and the missiles and torpedoes we have. This is the reason why you can go to Wikipedia today and look at the exact amount of fighter jets or aircraft carriers each country has. We know exactly the amount of weapons countries have. And this is mostly or most um, obvious with nuclear weapons. We all know the 11 countries on this planet which have nuclear weapons. And when you know that a country has nuclear weapons, then you know that you don't want to start a fight with that country because they have nuclear weapons. How do we know they have nuclear weapons? Well, they do nuclear weapons testing. 
they do testing so they can show they have the weapons. Nuclear weapons have only ever been used in wars two times in our history. Two times in 1945. All the rest of the power of nuclear weapons is in deterrence. Having the weapons, not using the weapons, just having them and showing them. And cyber weapons have no deterrence because no one knows what you have. We're not going to be able to show our offensive cyber power in a military parade. Like, what are you going to do? Put a bunch of nerds in the parade and show them off? That's not going to work. We can't show the power we have, which means cyber weapons have no deterrence power. And even if you wanted to show the weapons you have, how would you actually do it? Like, even if you could imagine that, okay, let's make, let's have some kind of war games, public demonstration of power, a rehearsal, and let's invite the world to watch. And then we'll do cyber attacks and show how we are taking down systems. That's not really going to show anything unless you actually show what are you exploiting. And you can't do that, because if you show your enemies what exactly you're exploiting in some system, then they can do the same. They can copy your weapon. They can't do that with any other types of weapons, but with cyber they can, which means we can't show them. And when you combine these two things, we end up with trouble. When you combine the fact that cyber weapons have no deterrence power and we can't show them, and the fact that they have a limited shelf life, they rot away, that means militaries and intelligence agencies around the world are building cyber weapons investing millions into these weapons and they only work for a short period of time after which you have to throw them away and no one even knew you had the weapons which means your whole investment was thrown into trash and this almost automatically builds a scenario where it's more likely that these weapons will end up getting used towards their end of the life the threshold to use them is getting lower and lower and I'm not saying that countries would start wars just to be able to use their weapons. Of course not. What I am saying is that militaries will start passing on their tools to intelligence agencies towards the end of the life of these weapons. But hey, we spent millions to build this weapon. We haven't been able to use it. It's not going to work for much longer, but maybe you can use it to gain access to our enemy systems and to spy on them. This is the scenario where we are, we, are, we are today. So the world changed in February. The world changed on the 23rd of February. The war in Ukraine started on the 24th, 12 hours before, on the evening of the 23rd, we found a new piece of malware. I work for a security company called WitSecure, headquartered in Helsinki, Finland. And around 5 p.m. on the evening of the 23rd, we found a new piece of malware which we attribute back to Russian government, which is called Hermetic Wiper. And it was found from Ukrainian systems. And it was deployed almost exactly 12 hours before Russian troops crossed the border in Ukraine. So they started softening the battlefield with cyber attacks before they started the real-world attacks. There's been plenty of talk about how Russian aggression against Ukraine hasn't been as successful as we've been expecting. Many analysts were expecting Russian troops to go all the way to Kyiv in a couple of days, and clearly that hasn't happened. Exactly in the same way, many people were expecting Russian cyber attacks to shut down Ukrainian systems immediately, and that didn't happen either. Why? Because Ukraine is the best country in Europe in defending their networks against governmental attacks from Russia. Ukraine is the best, better than Germany, better than France, better than United Kingdom, better than all of us Nordics. Why? 
because they have done their 10,000 hours of rehearsals. For the last eight years, they have been defending against Russian attacks, cyber attacks, in practice. None of the other European countries have, have done that. When Germany or Finland or France rehearses defense against Russian cyber attacks and Russian cyber weapons, we run tabletop exercises and war games against theoretical attacks. Ukraine doesn't. Ukraine has been defending against real attacks, for real, for eight years, including NotPetya of 2017, including Prikarbato Oblenergo attacks in 2015 some of the most destructive attacks we've ever seen. The end result is, by themselves and with the help given to them by Western partners, they are able to defend against most of the Russian attacks in cyberspace. Not all of them, but most of them. For example, during these last three months, they have stopped one attack which tried to cut power in most of Ukraine. They successfully deflected that attack. However, in the very beginning of the war, some of the Russian attacks in cyberspace were successful. Some of you might remember that in the very beginning of the war, there were massive queues at the border of Ukraine and Poland. Hundreds of thousands of women and children were trying to leave Ukraine to Poland, and they couldn't. They were waiting at the borders where there were up to 36 hours of queuing just to get out of Ukraine. And headlines all, all the world over were, were uh, wondering that why does it take so long to cross the border? What's the problem? And we know now what the problem was. The problem was Hermetic Wiper, the Russian destructive cyber attack, which had wiped, destroyed the computers used by Ukrainian border control. So the borders were open, but the computers didn't work. So they were doing everything by pen and paper, which meant Women and children had to queue for 36 hours just to leave the country. That's what cyber attacks look like. And that's a very practical effect, very practical example of the things cyber attacks have caused in Ukraine during this conflict. And I've been surprised about many things during these three months. Now, I live in Helsinki. I live two hours away from Russia. Both of my grandfathers fought the Russians in the Second World War. When I was younger, they were teaching me how to, how to fight the Russians in case we need to fight them again. I, I'm, I'm a bit sad I never made any notes about the stories they told me, because I never imagined seeing the news today. Earlier today, Finland and Sweden left a formal application to join NATO. And when Finland joins NATO later this year, it will more than double the NATO border Russia has. So if one of the tasks Vladimir Putin has when he invaded Ukraine was to try to keep NATO away from their borders, clearly he's failing. And it's really hard to see any logic in this attack. You see, for a decade, Russia was winning. Russia was winning with their cyber attacks, with their information attacks, and with the hybrid warfare they were waging against us, against the West, by shaping our opinions through troll factories and automatically tailored messaging sent to us through our own social media networks. Russians know that divided countries are weak countries. And they were able successfully to divide us for a decade to make us fight with each other. As an end result, over the last 10 years, e EU lost a country. In the United States, the capital was overrun last year. In USA, Democrats and Republicans have never been further apart. Russia was winning. Putin was holding the winning cards, and then in February he took the winning cards and threw them into trash. That's what he did. 
by invading Ukraine, we here in the West, at least for a moment, put away our fighting and united together to stand with Ukraine and to sanction off Russia with the strongest sanctions they've ever seen. And Ukraine is now being defended, not just by their own military, and in the networks, in the online world, they're not just defended by their own online troops and by the IT army of Ukraine, but by thousands of civilians from all over the world who are willing to break their own local laws to attack targets in Russia in order to support Ukraine. So have any of these cyber attacks from Western civilians made any, any difference? Well, yes, they have, definitely. There's been plenty of denial of service attacks, which are not that serious. They just slow down and shut down sites. But in addition of those, we've seen data breaches and break-ins to some of the largest oil, gas and coal companies in Russia, some of the largest ministries, the Russian Central Bank, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Russian biggest regulators, and hundreds of gigabytes of information have been stolen from these Russian organizations and made available online, which anybody can download, which you can download today. So will that make any difference? Well, yes, I, I, I think it will. Because right now, the biggest thing we can do is to make sure we effectively sanction Russia. And for effective sanctions, we need to know where did the money go? And of course, Russian organizations in the beginning of the war have been trying to hide the money they have. But now, because of these data leaks, we have hundreds of gigabytes of emails from the very same organizations, which means we can go and read their emails and read their financial records to see where did the money go. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if the actual people setting the sanctions are allowed to read data leaks, which would contain important information like this, but I hope they can. And one of the things which has really surprised me during these three months is how well Ukraine is still online. I've been having plenty of meetings over Zoom and Google Meets to Ukraine over these last months, to Kyiv, to Lviv, and to other cities. And every time I open up Zoom and have a meeting with the Ukrainians, I'm baffled that I'm getting full HD image to a country which is at war. It's quite remarkable how well they are able to stay online. And it's not for the lack of trying from Russians. Russians have been trying to cut them off. But they are failing. They're failing to remove Ukraine from the internet as well. And the most important explanation, what's key, what keeps Ukraine online, are the guys behind me. Guys like these. Technicians working for Ukrainian telecom companies. And there's, by the way, thousands of internet operators in Ukraine, which partially explains how they are able to stay online. But of course, they need to be able to keep the physical cables running, the cables which Russia is trying to cut and Russia is trying to bomb. The end result is that these telecom engineers are in a live battlefield next to a burned out tank, fixing fiber optic cable very concretely, risking their lives to keep a country online. Risking their lives to keep a country online. That's how important it is. That's how important it is to have internet connectivity to a country during wartime, because that's how we see what's happening. That's how we see what Zelensky is saying. This is how we see the truth of the atrocities which are going on right now in Ukraine. And that's why these, peoples, these people are risking their lives. Two months ago, I was giving a talk to members of the IT army of Ukraine, and I wanted to finish my talk by giving them a message of hope. So I I told them that one day this war will be over. This war will be over. And when the war is over, we, 
the West, the rest of the world. We want to be there with you, with Ukraine. We want to do business with you. We want to rebuild with you. Ukraine will rise, but Russia will not. Ukraine will rise, but Russia will not. Thank you very much. Thank you.